Welcome. Thank you all for joining me on today's episode of the Metabolic Classroom, powered, if you will, by Insulin IQ. As usual, this is a delightful opportunity for me to share with you some thoughts that have been bouncing around my brain and those that I consider to be helpful. Uh, as I've said before, of course, nothing thrills a professor more than having a new crop of students in a classroom, if you will. So I'm delighted for you all to be joining me, however you are tuning in today. Uh, let me, um, as we get started, let me just lay out the groundwork. So the focus for the lesson today is the uh, anti-diabetic drugs. Now you can tell from the name, um, anti-diabetic means that it's fighting the disease diabetes. Uh, but that term itself can be a little confusing. Um, but I also want to take a little time to describe the problem with most anti-diabetic drugs. And that is particularly the paradigm with which these drugs are in a way created. Um, these drugs are based on the idea of glucose being the villain. Now, I wanted to be able to I wanted to be able to have you listen to this discussion and participate in this classroom as a student uh, and have in mind both type one and type two diabetes uh, because they are kind of similar, but they're also kind of different. But by keeping them both in mind, it, I actually think it becomes helpful for you to then see what I consider to be the problem. And again, namely the glucose centric paradigm. So let's just start with a, a brief overview of type one and type two diabetes. Now, if I were to ask you to describe type one diabetes in the fewest possible words, you would say probably something like it is a disease of no insulin. Mm -hmm. And that would be absolutely right. Now there's a little more nuance to it. And indeed there's a little more background, namely the autoimmune aspect and the destruction of the beta cells that produce insulin. But regardless, the focus would be on um, the reduction of insulin to the point of negligible to zero and, and, and the, all the, the metabolic complications that come from that because insulin just has such a chokehold on all things metabolic. Now with type two diabetes, how would you describe it? You can't say it's a disease of no insulin because it isn't. It is never a disease of no insulin. Type 2 diabetes is never a disease of no insulin. Unfortunately, some of the language surrounding type 2 diabetes makes us think it's a disease of no insulin because you'll hear terms like insulin becomes insufficient. Well, what does that mean? That's a relative term. Insufficient for what? Well, it means in what they mean by that is it's insufficient for controlling blood sugar levels. In reality, if it's actual type two diabetes, insulin levels are higher than normal. It, it, if you look at insulin levels over the life of the type two diabetic, they have gone up and up and up and up, continued to go up. And then in some instances of type two diabetes, it may crest, it peaks and starts to come down but it never goes down to zero. That's not type two diabetes. Now there are rare instances called LADA, L-A-D-A, latent autoimmune diabetes of the adult, which is basically just a late onset type one. It may be coincident that someone with type two diabetes develops type one later in life, but that's not type two anymore. And, uh, that's a different disease that just happens to be address, uh, focusing on or targeting the pancreas. So with type two diabetes, insulin never goes to zero, even though it may come down a bit, but even if it comes down and it peaks and crests and starts to drop again, as I just described, it's still multiples higher than it was before the person ever started on this, in, on this journey towards type two diabetes. So if you're, if you're watching me, um, then, then it would go something like insulin levels are really, really low. They're climbing over the life of the person year over year over year. Mind you, all while, glu all while glucose is staying flat. And then it comes up and then it can start to turn and come down a bit. But even if it comes down, it's still much, much higher than it is when it started and higher than it would be, than higher than is ideal in someone who's metabolically healthy or who has good insulin sensitivity. Now, still, however, the problem then to bring this back to the topic really is that we have lumped these diseases together because the most obvious manifestation 
of type one diabetes, which historically was the only one that really ever existed prior until about a hundred ish years ago, maybe 150 or so. Um, it was the most obvious manifestation or sign and symptom was a consequence of the high glucose, namely the excess urine production, polyuria. In fact, the term diabetes comes from the word of excess, this Greek term for the excessive production of urine or to flow through too quickly. So the most obvious manifestation of the disease was the high urine production which itself was a consequence of the high glucose. And so the urine was enriched with all this glucose and flies would come to it as if it were coming to honey. And that's where the mellitus term comes from. Diabetes mellitus basically just means a honeyed urine. Now that's not to say it's sweet because glucose does not taste sweet. So that whole idea is, is a sort of a myth or a legend. You know, you're not tasting it and tasting something sweet. It's that it's attracting flies or dogs maybe licking it up be because there's glucose in it, which is not sweet. Glucose doesn't taste sweet. Fructose tastes sweet, but that's not what's coming out. So the most obvious sign of diabetes classically was a result of the high glucose. And unfortunately, that view has persisted where we still look at type 2 diabetes as a disease of too much glucose. When if we had a more precise paradigm, we would view it as a disorder of too much insulin. So in that sense, it becomes the exact opposite of type 1 diabetes. Yes, they both share a tendency for hyperglycemia, but they get to that end through two totally different means. In the case of type 1 diabetes, it's because of a true deficiency of insulin. In the case of type 2 diabetes, it's because the insulin isn't working very well. In other words, insulin resistance. Now, with all of that as a framework, again, and to state it again, the, the, the glucose-centric paradigm of diabetes, um, let's go in now to the description of, of some of these most commonly used diabetes drugs, because that's the focus of the metabolic classrooms for this month being recorded in the month of March, it was really just to do an overview of common drugs used for general cardiometabolic health, whether it was weight loss or the GLP-1s like last time, um, today diabetes, and next time being heart disease drugs. Um, now, all of this said, I don't want you to think that high glucose isn't a problem. Chronic hyperglycemia is pathogenic. It can harm the body. However, so much of what we associate with type 2 diabetes, namely the increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, the increased risk of cancer, the increased risk of heart disease and fatty liver disease, those are not problems of the hyperglycemia, but they are problems of the hyperinsulinemia, the high insulin and the associated insulin resistance. So just remember that. My final comment on this then, before we actually get into the drugs for the remainder of the lesson time and then Q&A um, for those who are joining live. Um, the, the final point before going further is that uh, if you have a glucose-centric paradigm, in other words, if your sole focus when you look at the person with diabetes is to lower the glucose at all costs, then you don't care what insulin is doing. And remember, I just got done describing how so much of the pathologies associated with type 2 diabetes in particular are a consequence of the insulin resistance, not the hyperglycemia. Not to say hyperglycemia is benign, it isn't, but it is the lesser of two evils. It's the Robin to the Batman or, or the whoever the Joker's sidekick is to the Joker for invoking a, a villainous side here. Um, so it's the, it's the insulin resistance. So again, if you are trying to lower glucose and to do so you are increasing insulin, and because why not? After all, you have a glucose-centric paradigm. The conventional clinical view would say that's worth it. It's good. Let's lower glucose at all costs. Then you'd be fine with it. And unfortunately, there are consequences to that perspective that are disastrous. Moreover, as a final point beyond the final point I intended to make, a glucose-centric paradigm where you're only measuring the patient's glucose causes us to actually start detecting these metabolic problems years later. Because remember, as a person is progressing towards type 2 diabetes, it's the insulin that's climbing. It's the canary in the coal mine or the earlier signal. It's the insulin that's climbing all the while glucose is staying normal. 
If you're waiting for glucose to rise, then you're going to detect the problem 10 or 20 years later, potentially. All right, let's get started with the first of, and I'm going to go through seven overall sort of segments of, of drug um, of drug classes, if you will, and in some instances, it's just a single drug. The first one being metformin. Metformin is the most widely prescribed anti-diabetic drug on the planet for two reasons. One, it's cheap, it's off patent, and two, it works. Uh, and, and indeed, I've classically given metformin one of the better grades if I had to grade anti-diabetic medications because it generally works the proper way, which is it improves insulin sensitivity. Now, before I go, I, I'm already going a little too far. I'm getting ahead of myself. Despite it being the most commonly used anti-diabetic drug, it's actually, of all the ones we're going to go through today, the least understood. Isn't that funny? That if you actually start diving into the precise cellular mechanism whereby metformin will improve the diabetes outcomes in someone, uh, you are going to get into a very thick forest of confusion. Um, but the main theme of metformin is that it acts by targeting the mitochondria. So that's the main mechanism of action. Now, this is where things do get confusing because some publications will find that it actually acts by improving mitochondrial function. Uh, and, and one of the metrics of doing this in a workhorse tool in my own lab is measuring what's called mitochondrial respiration, or basically how much are the mitochondria breathing? How much are they taking in oxygen? Um, and the purpose of the oxygen is to fuel the flames of metabolism to create energy for the cell in the form of ATP. Now, I don't want to go any further than that with regards to bioenergetics, um, but but that's but the mitochondria are the focus of metformin. But again, the confusion being: is it actually improving mitochondrial function, or is it compromising mitochondrial function? I was a co-author on a paper. So I lean this way because we did some of the work suggesting that metformin actually compromises mitochondria. And by disrupting one of the electron transport complexes, and I'm, I'm getting more specific than I intended, you're actually inhibiting or, or compromising the mitochondria's ability to burn fuel in order to create ATP as the cellular energy. In so doing, the, in so doing, reducing ATP, you end up activating an enzyme called AMPK. And AMPK is an ultimate kind of catabolic master switch. It wants the cell to start burning energy. So if AMPK is activated, glycolysis goes up, so the cell starts using more glucose. And lipolysis and beta oxidation of fats go up, so you start burning more fat for fuel. So metformin ends up having all of these generally favorable metabolic outcomes. In fact, metformin, and this is ironic in light of what we're going to get to in just a moment, is sometimes referred to as an exercise mimetic. So it's sometimes described as a drug that can mimic the effects of exercise. Now, before I get to the irony in just a moment and talk about the side effects, all of this being said, this means that metformin will have two general effects that have been pretty well documented. One is that it reduces the liver's production of or, or breakdown of glycogen and, and gluconeogenesis. So in other words, it's stopping or slowing or inhibiting, how many more synonyms can I think of there, the liver's production or output of glucose, which is a good thing. That's going to reduce blood glucose levels, which helps insulin come down. And then speaking of insulin, there's evidence to suggest that muscle, which by mass is the main insulin sensitive, insulin dependent tissue in the body, the muscle becomes more insulin sensitive directly. And again, it's the mitochondria that appears to be the mechanism for all of this. And precisely how the mitochondria are responding to metformin is a, a, a bit unclear. Now, let's talk about the consequences. So one of the most obvious consequences to someone on metformin is the, is the bubbling in the tummy, if you will, the nausea and the GI distress, some nausea and diarrhea. Um, that's the generally main symptom. But then the mitochondria-specific effects are relevant. There are multiple papers to show that, especially as we age, if people are on metformin, metformin is directly blunting the body's favorable adaptation to exercise. 
whether it is aerobic or resistance. So there are studies in humans to show that metformin blunts the mitochondrial adaptations to endurance exercise. So if someone is running or engaging in any kind of aerobic activity, normally you would expect their mitochondria to get better and stronger because of that activity. Metformin stops that. It blunts that from happening. Additionally, there's evidence in older humans to find that uh, metformin blunts the muscle adaptation, the muscle protein synthesis, the growing and strengthening of muscle tissue in response to in, uh, resistance exercise. Uh, so uh, I find it particularly amusing that these longevity gurus, and I do mean to kind of have that dripping with sarcasm and a little disrespect, um, that a lot of these people who have become experts, if you will, in longevity, an area in which you cannot be an expert because there's no human um, trials to support that. Um, they, In one breath, they'll be advocating metformin, and then in the other, they're advocating exercise. Those two don't go together nicely. Okay, so that's it for metformin, the most widely used drug. I guess if I were to put a summary statement on this, and I didn't intend to say this, so we'll see how it comes out. Um, my view of metformin is generally favorable if you don't exercise. If you can exercise, then do, and, and then be a little more wary of the metformin. All right, now the next, one of the next most common interventions for diabetes is insulin therapy itself. Now, of course, insulin therapy is critical and life-saving for people with type one diabetes, but it ends up being life threatening, if you will, and someone with type 2 diabetes, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Of course, the, the justification now and the rest of the conversation will be framed in the context of type 2 diabetes, um, and generally is, unless I say otherwise. Um, the view with insulin, the justification for insulin therapy in type 2 diabetes is based totally on the glucose-centric paradigm, that if your view of type 2 diabetes is that we need to lower glucose at all costs, then you would say, why not? Let's give them an insulin syringe and have them shoot that insulin straight into their veins to lower their glucose. And it will lower their glucose. But unfortunately, there are complications. But before I get into that, some, there are lots of different types of insulin, rapid acting, short acting, long acting. Um, some of the long acting, which are the more common ones, they have the, they end with the term R gene or gene as a suffix at the end of some of the drug classes. So you'll like glargine. Um, they are, uh, these are drugs that are, well, they're, they're insulin. They come into the body and they're just going to act like insulin. And so no surprise that um, there's a risk of reducing your blood sugar a little too quickly. So hypoglycemia is a common concern. Of course, we've talked previously about body fat changes. It's no surprise that the moment you put a diabetic type one or type two, on insulin therapy, they're going to gain fat mass, they're going to gain weight, and that will mostly be fat. A fascinating study was published out of Japan a number of years ago that looked at insulin injection sites. You've heard before that if, you're, if there's a diabetic on insulin therapy, they need to rotate their injection sites. The reason for this is that insulin promotes the growth of fat cells so well that they will end up getting these exaggerated fat blobs um, in their body. So the study out of Japan actually conducted a biopsy of the fat, and they measured the fat at the site of the injection where the body had kind of gotten this little bulb of fat, and then they measured a fat biopsy just a few centimeters away at a site that was still in the same overall fat depot but not getting the direct injection of insulin. And they found that the fat cells were about 10 times bigger by volume at the site of the insulin injection. I mean, it's just absolute proof positive of insulin's effect on fat cells and ultimately promoting growth. Now, beyond the inconvenience of gaining weight, there are true um, dis chronic disease concerns, all of which has been shown admittedly through correlational studies in humans. Um, but the first is a heart disease risk that insulin therapy in type 2 diabetes is associated with an in increased heart uh, cardiovascular risk. And there's this dose-dependent association. So the more insulin someone has to inject in order to keep their glucose in check, which is to say another way, the more insulin resistant you are, 
and now you're pushing your insulin up to these almost super physiological levels, um, then the more likely you are to die from heart disease. And this is directly contributing to hypertension, dyslipidemia, atherosclerosis, and more. So uh, again, um, giving the type 2 diabetic insulin is going to increase their risk of heart disease. There's also an increased risk of cancer. Now, I speak about cancer very, very delicately because there's so much we don't understand about cancer. But once again, there's this dose-dependent risk that as insulin dose requirements are going up in the type 2 diabetic, so too does the risk of cancer mortality. And then third and final is a risk of Alzheimer's disease, that there's evidence to suggest that if you put a type 2 diabetic on insulin therapy, the risk of Alzheimer's disease goes up. There's a couple different studies that have been published on that topic over the past couple decades. So insulin therapy is a very good way to control glucose levels in a type 2 diabetic, but it is also a very, very good way of making the type 2 diabetic gain weight and have an increased risk of chronic disease and overall mortality. All right, let's get on to the next one, the third class. We've gone through metformin. We've talked about insulin therapy. Let's get into the so-called insulin secretagogues. And that is a general class. Um, and when I'm describing it, I'm actually just talking about sulfonylureas mostly. But then there's another class um, called the megl megalitinides. Um, and there are different, usually these insulin secretagogues, if it ends with uride or inide, as a suffix in the drug name, that's going to be one of these insulin secretagogues. What they have in common, as the name suggests, is that they both want to increase the production of insulin. They're basically forcing the beta cells of the pancreas to make more insulin. And again, if you have a glucose-centric view of the disease, then you don't care about that at all. And you would say, you wouldn't even know what insulin levels are in the person because you're so ignorant of them, you haven't even measured them with a conventional um, view of a conventional clinical view. So the insulin secretagogues, again, the most common being the sulfonylureas like gliburide and glipizide, um, they act by stimulating uh, insulin secretion from the beta cells. And so the consequences and the side effects are very, very similar to insulin therapy itself, um, including, uh, of course, an increased risk of heart disease. Um, there was a paper, uh, multiple papers published on this. Um, increased cancer risk, again, multiple papers published on that. And then lastly, even Alzheimer's disease. Now, there are more. I just sort of picked the big three here, um, these big chronic killers um, that we're all, uh, we all appreciate, if perhaps not always fear. So again, uh, similar outcomes and similar complications as with insulin therapy that we see with the sulfonylureas or the insulin secretagogues. Now with insulin secretagogue in mind, let's go to the next one, the fourth one. And I'll be brief here because we devoted the entire previous episode talking about this exclusively, namely GLP-1 and agonists. Commonly, GLP-1 agonists like semaglutide or liraglutide are also considered insulin secretagogues. But as I elaborated last time, that does not always appear to be the case. In fact, in humans, it appears to not be the case that if you treat someone with this with these GLP-1 agonists, you do not see this immediate increase in insulin. It may enhance the insulin response to a glucose load, um, but it generally just does not increase insulin like many people state that it does. Uh, and again, please listen to the previous episode to get more details. But the main mechanism of action here in this context being diabetes is the inhibition of glucagon and that these GLP-1 agonists are reducing the release of glucagon from the pancreas. And if glucagon comes down, then the liver is holding on to more of its glycogen and it's not breaking down the glycogen to be released as glucose. And moreover, it's not producing glucose from scratch from say lactate or other carbon sources. So that's the main mechanism of action for its anti-diabetic properties. And then the weight loss properties, as I elaborated last time and very briefly restating, are based on the inhibition of or the delayed gastric emptying. It's simply slowing the intestines down. So the food is sticking in the stomach longer, making you feel fuller longer and reducing your cravings. Okay, let's go to the next one, the fifth of these uh, hormone classes and general drug families is the thiazolidinediones. These are one of my favorites. 
not to say I'm an advocate of them, but because they're so effective at suggesting that fat tissue is that is so central to insulin resistance and thus to type two diabetes. Now we've long known that people who gain weight have a higher risk of type two diabetes and that indeed it's virtually um, unheard of to have type two diabetes and not be overweight to some degree. But so much of that, as you'll recall from the previous metabolic classrooms, is not a matter of how much fat mass you have, but rather a matter of the size of each of your fat cells. It, uh, uh, to say that again, it's the size of your fat cells that matter when it comes to fat and insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes, not how much fat you have per se. And you'll recall that different bodies have different tendencies to uh, produce fat cells. And if you have a particular body type due to genetics that produces more fat cells, then as you have more and more pressure to store fat because of high insulin and sufficient calories, then you'll just start you'll start making new fat cells. So all of your fat cells are small, but you will have more fat mass, but you'll be insulin sensitive because it's the size of the fat cells. So let's come back to the thiazolidine dions. These are drugs that end with the suffix azone, like pioglitazone or rosiglitazone. What they do is activate a nuclear receptor called P par gamma. In so doing, it stimulates a process called adipogenesis. Adipogenesis is the term to describe the production of new fat cells. And so this creates this delightfully um, paradoxical metabolic state where the type 2 diabetic who's overweight, who gets prescribed a thiazolidine dione, will in fact see an improvement in their insulin sensitivity in type 2 diabetes. And then here's the paradox, because they're getting fatter. If you can convince your fat cells to store more fat because they're multiplying, then the cells are all small and they're insulin sensitive and they're anti-inflammatory. Again, hearken, I'm hearkening back to previous episodes here and assuming you're a little more familiar with this. So please go back and listen to previous episodes describing the role of fat in insulin resistance. But again, these drugs are stimulating your fat's ability to make new fat cells thereby shrinking all of the fat cells. So all the fat cells are able to be smaller because there's so many more to help carry the metabolic burden of the fat. And so again, the paradox being you become more insulin sensitive while and because you're becoming fatter. So that's the main side effect. The main side effect is the fat gain and it is substantial. A person can find that they easily gain 20 pounds of pure fat within just a few months. All right, let's get on to the sixth one, which is the SGLT inhibitors. Now, just as a point of cell biology and physiology, the SGLT, uh, uh, which stands for, stands for sodium glucose transporter, and which is a type of a symport um, within the realm of cell biology. So these are transporters that are basically a doorway designed to open for sodium, but Glucose is so sneaky that it slips itself in. When the door opens for the sodium, glucose slides through it as well. And so every time you are moving a sodium, you're moving a glucose. That's a admittedly somewhat silly juvenile way of describing these SGLTs. There are other transporters for glucose that are exclusive to glucose called the glutes, the glucose transporters. This is not one of them, even though it does transport glucose, but it does so by hitching a ride with, with sodium. Now, we have these expressed primarily in two different places. You have SGLT1, which is expressed in the intestines. And that's one of the main mechanisms by which we move glucose from the intestines that we've just eaten, the starches and sugars that we eat or drink. It gets broken down to glucose, and we will move that glucose in primarily through SGLT1. But then we have SGLT2 in the kidney tubules to be very precise. So I'm going to kind of act out a general anatomy of the kidney. You have something called the glomerulus, which is the main, that's the business part of the kidney where you're filtering everything. Glucose is coming in through the blood vessels and getting pulled out into the renal, into the kidney tubule at the glomerulus because there's just little fenestrations or slits or pores and the glucose just slips through, no transporter needed. It's just it's slipping out through gaps. But the kidney tubule then has all of these SGLT2s, 
which will open up and it'll pull in the sodium and pull the glucose back with it. Now it's when we have so much glucose coming out that we overwhelm SGLT2 and then it ends up in the urine causing the diabetes or the polyuria, the excess urine production. That's when we've overwhelmed SGLT2's capacity. Speaking of overwhelming, someone could just take a drug that inhibits SGLT2. And now the glucose that's getting filtered at the kidney, at the glomerulus, is coming into the tubules of the kidney and can't get out. You can't reabsorb it back into the blood because the drug is blocking those transporters. And so now all the glucose stays in the kidney to be urinated out. So there's a lot here that I just said. So this is the obvious mechanism whereby you're lowering glucose, especially with SGLT2. But with SGLT1, you're blocking the glucose from being absorbed. So it stays in the guts and gives a person terrible diarrhea and flatulence. So we don't usually use SGLT1s because it's so inconvenient socially, if you will. SGLT2, you're just going to urinate a lot more. And that's a little more manageable. Now, there's a problem, though, with that, um, um, among some other side effects that we'll get to in just a moment, which is if you are loading your urinary tract with a lot of glucose all the time, you are essentially creating little Gatorade stations for bacteria on their marathon run up to your bladder. So the outside, the end of the urinary tract, at the end of the urethra, no surprise that it's a bit of a dirty place. There can be a lot of stuff going on down there, depending on male or female. Females have a little more going on because of anatomy. But it's no surprise that constantly bacteria are attempting to invade the urinary tract. The very process of urinating tends to flush that out. However, when your urine is loaded with glucose, you are literally giving these bacteria the one fuel that they're crying out for that lest they get too tired on their journey up to your bladder, you're feeding them on the way. So it's no surprise that people on SGLT2 inhibitors have a fantastically higher risk of urinary tract infections. And that's the main side effect. Now, there are some metabolic complications to SGLT2 inhibitors as well that are fascinating, specifically the production of ketones. It is well known that SGLT2 inhibitors will amplify ketogenesis. And in so doing, so, so it's, and that could be because of a glucagon activation, um, ironically, um, because you're overall lowering glucose, but glucagon can tend to enhance ketogenesis, um, or it's activating those glucagon receptors on the liver. But through some mechanism, poorly understood, there's this activation of ketogenesis from the liver. And that becomes a, a bit of a concern in if someone is taking an SGLT2 inhibitor and they are on a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. They may find that their mild state of ketosis has gone to the realm of ketoacidosis, that they go from hovering around one millimolar ketone, BHB, and they're, gone, they're up to eight or nine, which can be very dangerous. That's getting into the realm of ketoacidosis. So people who are going to take an SGLT2 inhibitor need to be very, very careful with their diet because the drug itself is going to generally be promoting a higher degree of ketogenesis. Okay, and now the last one that I only put in because of a common request from an insulin IQ metabolic classroom faithful um, is amylin an uh, an analogs. Sorry, I really stuttered there. Amylin analogs. Now, amylin, I mentioned very briefly um, in a previous episode, amylin is a secretion that comes with insulin. So it is co-secreted with insulin. Now, just a little cell biology primer with insulin. Within the beta cell, you, you create, we, we put insulin in a pre-packaged form, this pro form of insulin. So it's not insulin yet. It's kind of an immature version of insulin has been packaged in a vesicle, basically a little package. And this package is moving to the edge of the cell membrane about to embed itself in the cell membrane and release its contents, including the insulin. Now, on this journey, insulin goes from its immature state to its mature state. And to do this, it has parts of it clipped off. And part of this is amylin. So when you're releasing insulin, you are releasing amylin. So it's a co-secretion with insulin. And it's interesting to note that amylin complements insulin. It has been shown to inhibit glucagon, for example. Insulin does that too. 
And so you have this um, other molecule that will inhibit um, will inhibit a glucagon. Now, this is particularly relevant in type two, in type one diabetes. Remember, type one diabetes, um, as with the absence of insulin, there's this constant stream of glucagon coming out. And so the type 1 diabetic in particular is constantly fighting what glucagon is trying to do, namely increasing glucose. So if you have this injectable that can act to suppress glucagon, it can become very therapeutic at improving glucose levels. It also slows gastric emptying, kind of like the GLP-1 agonists do. So people can find that it helps just controlling appetite. One of the more common drugs, it may be the only one, is Simlin. That's the trade name in, of, of the um, amylin analog. Um, and then other than all of this, a side effect, the side effects appear to be pretty mild. And, and the only one I could really note was the nausea. Just because you're slowing down the intestines, it can give you some GI issues. Um, and, and so anything else that may be associated with that. All right, so those are the drugs. Starting from the bottom back up, the amylin analogs the SGLT inhibitors with a particular focus on SGLT2 in the kidney, um, the thiazolidine diones and their ability to induce the production of new fat cells, adipogenesis, thereby creating that metabolic paradox, which I find so delightful, namely the improvement of insulin sensitivity and type 2 diabetes, all while making the patient fatter. We also spoke about the GLP-1 agonists, and for much more detail on that, listen to the previous episode. We spoke about the insulin secretagogues, particularly sulfonylureas, how they act by increasing insulin, thereby lowering glucose, but also thereby increasing risk of chronic disease, similar as seen with insulin therapy itself in, the, in type 2 diabetes. And then we started with metformin being the most widely used and of all of these, the most poorly understood, ironically. And with that knowledge... I feel comfortable that you're ready to go out and speak with your friends and family and professionals about the so-called anti-diabetic medications. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. All right. Now, those of you who have joined live, let's get to your questions. Thanks again. Those who are live, I appreciate the time you take uh, to join me here. It's very, very gratifying for me um, uh, to see you take this time and join me. I really appreciate it. All right. Remember, 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 I'm not your clinician, so I'm not giving you medical advice with any of this. I'm simply your friendly neighborhood scientist sharing insight born from published research. As noted by the Insulin IQ team here, make sure, please do go to YouTube and subscribe. Continue to join me here, but let your friends and family know about the classroom that they can find on YouTube if they ever miss an episode. All right, Jackie. Last week, you talked about the importance of eating protein with natural fats to release bile so it's metabolized properly. But what happens when you eat low-fat or fat-free protein? Yes, Jackie, you may find, um, you wouldn't notice this, but on, uh, you, may, you will likely absorb less of the protein, so you're getting less of the physiological benefit of those amino acids. But also, you may get a little diarrhea. It's well known in the bodybuilding community. I don't remember the exact term, but they kind of have a term for the upset tummy and the diarrhea that comes from taking a lot of just pure, pure protein because of the fear of fat. So you may find that it upsets your tummy. Um, and then Jackie follows up. Does it get converted to glucose or stored as fat? Jackie, I think you are referring to the protein. It is, um, it is almost impossible for protein to get broken down to carbons, which are then stored as fat. That is, that is practically impossible. You'll notice I'm not saying totally impossible. Slightly more likely, and thus a little more common, is its ability to get converted to glucose. But even that does not happen very readily. The body does not convert protein into nutrient in, into these caloric heavy nutrients like fats and glucose very readily. Now, it can do so, and it would do glucose more than fat, um, but that's an extraordinarily unique metabolic state. So I would suggest you never worry about protein, about overconsuming protein, lest it being turned to glucose or fats. Carnivore for Future says, hi, Ben. Hello, Carnivore for Future. Oh, I see you have a question here. Um, 
I fasted a lot 15, for 15 months. Should I be worried about the mean corpuscular volume and mean corpuscular hemoglobin? That's the MCV or MCH. Those are components of a complete blood count or a CBC. So they are on the high side. No, I wouldn't worry about that at all. Um, and your HbA1c is down and your C peptide is low, which is a sign of low insulin, which is not a bad thing in a non-type 1 diabetic. Um, no, I don't think you need to be worried a bit. Remember, I'm not your clinician. Um, please, please remember that. But no, if you tend to have a higher mean corpuscular vol volume and hemoglobin, you are very rare. And it wouldn't surprise me if you are eating carnivore because you're getting a lot of very nutrient-dense foods, including heme, iron. Um, DZ asks, does metformin impact how the body processes vitamin B12? That's a really good question. Um, I've never heard of that, but let's see if there's anything that comes up with a quick search. Well, it looks like indeed it can, in fact, contribute. I would predict, um, just for the sake of time, that it... So, so yes, to be clear, it does appear that metformin use does reduce B12. I suspect it would have something to do with the guts. One of the unique aspects of B12 is that you need to produce... Uh, a factor, a, a protein from the stomach called intrinsic factor. And I wouldn't be surprised if metformin somehow blocks um, intrinsic factor production. So again, intrinsic factor is what's allowing the body to later absorb the B12. Um, and so it looks, I would suspect metformin is somehow compromising that overall interaction. Um Cridgeway 3, did not know metformin does this to muscles. Yes, most people don't. Um, Yvette um, notes, exercise is not an option. It's not an option. It's mandatory, you guys. You really do need to exercise um, for every reason. Um, DZ, insulin therapy and high carb contribute to obesity. I've been able um, to lose 125 pounds. Wow, st since stopping both insulin and carbs. In fact, just to be clear, I'd put an order the other way. You started controlling your carbs through your diet, and that simply meant you did not need the insulin therapy. But of course, always talk to your clinician. I'm not your clinician, so I'm not giving you medical advice. Um, Yvette notes, an amazing long, long ago, type 2 was considered non-insulin dependent diabetes. Yes, and in fact, it still should be called that. It is, If it is type 2 diabetes, it is not insulin dependent. Rich Hart notes that Peter Atia supports the use of metformin for longevity. Yes, I, I, I'm very curious about promoting metformin. Um, if you look at the use of metformin, one of my problems with people who really um, have become uh, focused on longevity is that you must, by necessity, base virtually all of your statements on animal studies or insect studies looking at longevity. And that, of course, is very problematic. If you are a, a mouse living in a cage, um, in this perfectly controlled environment, then metformin sh sh suggests, the evidence suggests metformin is going to help you live longer. But in the real world, you need muscle. And one of the greatest predictors of longevity is muscle mass. And if you are taking a drug that's inhibiting your body's ability to make muscle, which it does in the case of metformin, um, that to me puts these two approaches at odds. So I, I don't, believe we should be espousing the use of, of metformin. Uh, moreover, on a related topic, I need to do a separate um, metabolic classroom on this topic, but even the use of rapamycin, um, you guys have probably heard of this as well. Uh, that's a really, really great way to just kind of wreck your body. Um, and, and humans who take rapamycin for organ transplant um, really have pretty relevant consequences, particularly at the gonads, where the product in men, this has been shown to really inhibit the production of testosterone and to generally create um, gonadal atrophy, which is not ideal in my case. So what would be the point of living longer if I am destroying my one of my most essential endocrine organs? All right. DZ, thank you. Um, thanks for tuning in. I'm so glad these things have been helpful based on your comment. Carnivore for future. Is there any science on seed oils affecting blood sugar? Um, that's a good question. Uh, and we need to just be a little cautious. So for the record, I do believe seed oils are tremendously impactful and harmful. 
but I'm not, maybe because I'm not so familiar with that area of research, um, I, I try to be a little uh, careful. I'm unaware of a human study showing the consumption of seed oils causing hyperglycemia. There are studies certainly to show an infusion, um, but infusing fat is not the same as eating fat. But uh, there's evidence to suggest seed oils compromise fat cell growth, thereby making them insulin resistant. And so maybe I'll just answer that question with what I know. There is evidence to show that seed oil consumption with linoleic acid as the primary fat will accumulate in fat cells, producing a metabolite that compromises the fat cell's ability to multiply, thus promoting only hypertrophy of the fat cell and thus causing insulin resistance. Rich noting that a study is suggesting that metformin is not good for longevity. Yes. Um, Anomar. For 13 years, I worked out with metformin being my number one diabetes drug. I stopped taking it September 23rd. I am curious how you're doing. Um, it certainly would, the evidence would certainly suggest your exercise got better. Um, all right. Um, Yvette noting SGLT2s. Yes, they're very commonly used drugs. Uh, Chuck, one of the issues with the use of drugs like insulin for type 2 diabetes is the typical medical paradigm is to treat symptoms without a sufficient understanding of the disease to be treated. Well said, Chuck. You're, you're basically, deliberate or not, you're sort of re- framing what I started at the very beginning of my conversation today, which is that the hyperglycemia itself is a consequence of an underlying problem, namely the insulin resistance. And so if you have a glucocentric paradigm of diabetes drugs, you are just treating a symptom, which let's admit it, most drugs do. Carly shares a comment from Shauna. Can you speak to exercise-induced hypoglycemia? That's not common, Shauna. Most people, especially anyone who's note, wear, worn a CGM would note that typically when you exercise, your blood glucose levels climb. And that's a consequence largely of epinephrine, this, this acute stress hormone. You start to exercise, epinephrine goes up very quickly, and that promotes the liver to start releasing stored glucose. If someone is experiencing hypoglycemia during exercise, that's, that's not... Um, something's wrong. Uh, frankly, that should not be happening. And it suggests a deeper, I would say something, um, some endocrine problem, maybe a liver problem. Um, like for example, there are instances of people who experience hypoglycemia and get migraines when they fast. Those people, I think, I think I'm citing a study here, I believe I recall a study finding that these are people who appear to have had some kind of liver damage, like a hepatitis infection, where the liver wasn't responding properly to glucagon. It may be something similar here, um, Shauna, uh, but alternatively, it may be just a, an acute kind of artifact that maybe it's a, if you, in fact, I'll end, the, I'll end my very poor answer this way. Make sure you're not eating something very sugary before you start exercising. If you are pre-loading, maybe you're taking a pre-workout and it's loaded with starches and sugars, and it might be hidden in the form of just dextrose or maltodextrin, which just turns into glucose. If you spike your insulin before you exercise, you can absolutely move into a rebound hypoglycemia. That is not uncommon at all. So I would suggest if this is something you're experiencing, it is such an unnatural response to exercise that it's probably due to an unnatural um, intervention. Namely, you're eating or drinking something you shouldn't right before you exercise. Maybe try mixing it up. Amanda Yue, thank you. Sadly, I have to hop off to dispense medications. Hopefully not too many anti-diabetics. Amanda, Andrea, many type 1 diabetes or diabetics and likely serious type 2 diabetics develop gastroparesis not associated with medications. Is that due to insulin resistance and tissue damage? So gastroparesis is just this sort of freezing or really slowing of the intestines. I actually comment on this in my book um, uh, in Why We Get Sick, but I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to try to elaborate on a precise mechanism, um, but it could be due to nerve damage which itself can be a result of both insulin resistance and the starving of the nerves, as well as the hyperglycemia-induced damage. 
Grid A3, do the, um, I'm not totally sure. Oh, rosy glitazone. Uh, you elaborate on it later. Does rosy, rosy glitazone have cardiac effects also? Yeah, so the the uh, PPAR gamma activators, the thiazolidine diones, do have other consequences, including heart and bone issues. I didn't elaborate on those because they're just much less common, and I just focused on the weight gain. Jackie, I'm on an SGLT2 inhibitor for my heart failure, not diabetic. I'm still keto, and I struggle to get over one or reduction in blood sugars. Any thoughts why? That is very surprising, Jackie. And and I know we've talked before and, and you're you've sharing your frustration on your um unique metabolic state, it seems. But no, if you're on an SGLT2 inhibitor, you should have no problem getting into ketosis. Again, the concern should be that you're getting too high. Um uh Jackie, have you ever uh, you maybe something going on with the liver? Um uh, it might be worth just confirming that your liver is healthy, that your liver enzymes are normal, ALT and AST. Um, Cridgeway, would you have a chart of these meds and side effects that we could have? I, I, I don't have a chart that I've made up, but you would find I have some table in my book, Why We Get Sick, over one of my shoulders here, where I do list out the anti-diabetic drugs and give them a grade and generally describe them. That might be the best place. Um, from Jeff on the website, he asked a question through the website. Could you help me understand what is meant on page 153 of your book, why we get sick An insulin spike with eating protein in the context of a low carbohydrate diet would be dangerous. So he's directly, so Jeff's quoting me there. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of confusion around the role of dietary protein and its effect on insulin. And what I meant by that statement was just to highlight the differential response to dietary protein depending on the glucose levels of a person. If a person is eating protein and their glucose levels are low or normal, fasted normal, and they're not eating the protein with glucose, you get little to no insulin response, um, essentially no insulin response. And there's human evidence to support this. I'm not making any of this up. And, and the reason for this, the reason why I state in my book that it would be dangerous is because you can't afford an insulin spike to inhibit gluconeogenesis. The only reason your blood glucose levels are staying normal in this fasted or low-carb state is because insulin is low and thus the liver is free to be making glucose and releasing it into the bloodstream. So if you had normal glucose levels and you took in a protein load and without any glucose, and your insulin spiked uh, considerably, it would inhibit gluconeogenesis and you would go hypoglycemic and potentially lose consciousness. However, if you take glucose with your protein or you are taking protein and you're already hyperglycemic, like a diabetic, it's no surprise that you will get an insulin response. And that's generally the way it goes. Jeff, hopefully that helps. Um, C-peptide, Aaron asks about C-peptide. Why measure it? That's a good question. C-peptide is a good marker of insulin production. Just like how I described amylin as being a, a co-secretor with insulin, every time you release an insulin, amylin sneaking out too, so too is C-peptide. In fact, you'll notice if you went back that I did sort of two little clips because I had in mind when I said that amylin being snipped off this immature version of insulin and C-peptide. So C-peptide is a good marker of insulin production, not insulin level. It has a very different half-life than insulin. Um, Cridgeway, check B12. Yes, that's good. Um, I'm just, as we're nearing the end of the hour, I want to just make sure I get through a lot of these good questions. Um, so carnivore for future notes, blood sugar goes up about a millimolar if you eat any seed oil. Um, it's hard to ignore that. I'm always pay attention to how your body's responding, regardless of what I say. Um, Anomar, regarding my seizing of metformin and exercise, I felt like the tin man who had his joints oiled. I felt like I was gliding. Um, I, so what I mean, I hope by that you mean that you feel great now that you're off metformin and exercising still. But again, of course, always talk to your clinician. I'm never just I'm never telling anyone to change anything. Um, carnivore for future after switch over to pure animal fat. My vitamin D levels went up by five times. That That's remarkable um, and wonderful. Um, part of that could be just you're eating a little more vitamin K as well. It's a little known fact that um, if you really want to maximize your vitamin D, take vitamin D3 
and K2. K2 helps with the absorption. Um, all right. Okay, and Jackie, last comment. You know, your blood test from your liver um, scan was fine. Um, I don't know, Jackie. We'll continue to communicate. You guys, thanks again, as ever, for joining me today. I hope this was helpful. Just remember, the more you know about your metabolic health, the more you can do to control it and stay healthy. I will see you next time, and we'll talk more about the cardiometabolic drugs, why they're used, what they do, and some of the complications with them. Can't wait. I'll see you then.